Um, welcome everybody to the New York Society Library. I'm Carolyn Waters, the head librarian. And um, we are really thrilled to present the first in a series of three programs uh, on the intersection of art and activism in the Anthropocene. We are especially grateful to Guernica Magazine for bringing this program to us and for Orion Magazine for their support as well. And thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, before we begin, a couple, uh, a couple house housekeeping notes. Um, first, if you have cell phones or any other devices that may make noise, please turn them off. Um, we are also broadcasting the presentation and the Q&A. And um, we are also, for the first time, broadcasting it on Facebook Live. It's a brave new world for the library. So uh, books are available for sale by our friends from the corner bookstore outside. So please, uh, please take advantage of that. And I'm sure the authors will be happy to uh, sign in afterward. And now let me uh, introduce our panelists. Uh, so Chantal Bilodeau is a playwright and translator whose work focuses on the intersection of science, policy, art, and climate change. She is the artistic director of the Arctic Cycle, an organization created to support the writing, development, and production of eight plays that look at the social and environmental changes taking place in the eight countries of the Arctic. And she's also the founder of the blog and an international network, Artists in Climate Change. She is a co-organizer of Climate Change Theater Action, and a worldwide series of readings and performances of short climate change plays presented in support of the United Nations COP. Davis Wallace Wells uh, is a deputy editor at New York Magazine, where he also writes often about climate science in the near future, including his 2017 cover story, The Uninhabitable Earth on Worst Case Scenarios for Global Warming. This story quickly became the most read story in New York Magazine's, uh, in New York Magazine's history. Um, and I absolutely understand it was terrifying. Um, before joining New York, David was deputy editor at the Paris Review and previously served as the New York Sun's books editor. He's currently working on a book about the meaning of global warming, not just how climate, will, uh, climate chaos will transform and degrade the planet, but also how it will shape our culture, our politics, our psychology, and philosophy. William T. Bowman is the National Book Award winning author of 10 novels, four collections of stories, a memoir, and six works of nonfiction, all in our stacks. His latest book is the two volume Carbon Ideologue, which explores global warming and the factors in human actions that have led to it including descriptors, descriptions of Volman's own risky ventures to the no-go zones of Fukushima, Japan, following the nuclear reactor meltdowns. The series' full, first volume, No Immediate Danger, is on sale, um, out, available outside, and booksellers can also take advance orders for the second volume, which will be coming out in June. And last but not least, our moderator this evening is Amy Grady, and she is the deputy publisher of Guernica Magazine and also senior editor at the Chicago Review of Books. So thank you all, and start the program. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Is that? All right, great. Um, thank you, thank you, Carolyn, so much for that great introduction, and thank you to the New York Society Library for having us this evening um, in this beautiful, beautiful space. Um, as Helen mentioned, uh, my name is Amy Brady. I am the deputy publisher of Guernica Magazine. And for those of you who haven't heard of us, we have been publishing online since 2004, um, mostly at the intersection of global arts and politics. Um, we have published, to my mind, some of the greatest writers working today, uh, as well as many talented up-and-coming writers who, after publishing with us, move on to even greater things. Um, so uh, we are a, a great space for important, uh, vital, incisive voices. Uh, uh, and um, as a nonprofit magazine, we are run entirely by a group of volunteers um, and depend largely on uh, the support of our friends to keep going. So uh, if you'd like to know more about the magazine, please don't hesitate to come and chat with me after tonight's talk. And um, there are also some information sheets at the back if you'd like to know more. Um, I also want to thank all of you guys for being here this evening. Um, this is a very important topic, and it's so nice to share space with um, some like-minded individuals who are as interested in this topic as we are. 
And um, of course, I am very thankful uh, for our um, wonderful panel of guests who are here this evening. Um, it is a privilege and a pleasure to be sharing uh, this platform with you guys, and I am so excited to uh, talk about the work that you're doing and um, how it contributes to our greater conversation of art uh, activism and climate change. Um, the three of you approach uh, talking about climate change through different mediums, but um, the one thing that does uh, that you guys all do have in common is the fact that you, you do talk about climate change uh, in such a way that makes it uh, seem like a vital and important topic that it is. Um, so to begin tonight, I want to start at the beginning and just ask you guys what drew you to this topic and uh, what uh, motivated you to address it in the stories that you tell. Um, Chantal, do you want to begin with you? So it was a combination of things that made me um, interested in climate change. I was interested in the environment as a in my personal life because I like to hike. You know, I've been my father um, uh, was a as a hobby was a bush pilot, so he would take us up north. I'm originally from Canada in Quebec, and um, his big thing was to go to lakes that were only accessible by plane. So I was used to being up outside in nature. And then um, in 2007, I have a friend who I met outside of the country who lives in Alaska and runs an air taxi company out of Denali National Park. And I had, I had known him for about 10 years and I always promised I would go and visit and had never been. And um, that he, I, we, I hadn't been in touch with him for about six years and then my phone rang and it was him, and he said, I just wanted to know if your phone number was still good. <laughs> so I said, okay, this summer I'm coming, I'm coming to visit you. So I went to Alaska, and of course 2007 was the year after Al Gore's movie An Inconvenient Truth came out. So the combination of having climate change uh, more present in the public conversation, and then experiencing it firsthand and hearing people in Alaska who of course were already um, affected by it, um, really drew my attention to it, and um, and then uh, made. Uh, that's when I started thinking, oh, maybe this is something I can address in my work, which I had never thought of before. So it was all of these things together, and then um, and then of course even addressing it in my work. At, at first I thought, nah, this is not going to work. It's going to be boring, and so it took a little while, and then eventually um, I locked onto an idea, and I continued with that. For me, um, the, I think the short answer is fear, basically. Um, as a journalist, I was sort of um, always poking around news from science and looking at scientific papers, looking at sort of fringier aspect parts of the internet to find um, real news of the near future. And the more that I was doing that over the last few years, the more that I was seeing really alarming new findings about climate. And you know, in my daily readings of the New York Times and the New Yorker and all the other you know kind of mainstream publications that I read all the time, I felt that there was a huge gap between what the science was saying about what was going to happen to our planet and how that story was being told to people who weren't as engaged in the issue as um, even someone like I was. And I'm not an environmentalist. I'm, I've lived my whole life in New York. I've, I have no special love for nature, um, <laughs> and my my and, you know my commitment to, on climate change is really about concern for human life in uh, a damaged world, and you know I but the the more that I learned about what was happening, what was likely to happen, um, the more I realized that this wasn't about you know um, ecosystems being damaged in distant places, and it wasn't about um, shorelines rising up a few feet, but for everyone that was miles from the shoreline, that would be fine. It was something that was going to transform every aspect of human life everywhere on the planet. And it just seemed to me as a kind of, even on, on a kind of entrepreneurial, journalistic level, that that story was not at all being told. Um, and as a result, I was like, let me dive in, let me tell that story. Um, and as a result of that, I find myself sort of as an um, accidental activist advocate um, who feels even more than before that the story is um, 
really urgent, overwhelming, and you know, pushes aside anything, any other story that you might want to tell about the near future. <clears throat> I have a little girl named Lisa who's now getting big. She's 19. And um, I was always very, very uh, resistant to and resentful of this issue. I thought, you know, um, this is not going to affect me. Uh, and I have so many other things to worry about. I just hate even thinking about it. Um, I went to uh, Fukushima, Japan. Um, shortly after the tsunami reactor disaster. Um, and what I saw was quite horrible. Um, that was the, the beginning of my um, thinking and, uh, and walking around through these red zones. Uh, at first, they weren't so bad. They looked just very recently abandoned. So um, you might find a potted plant uh, that was just beginning to wilt or an umbrella, you know, leaning up in the door. Um, but as the years went by, these places, of course, got creepier and creepier with vines growing over the signs, weeds coming up through the sidewalk, snow drifting in through broken windows, um, and high radiation readings that I measured. Um, the more I talked to um, the utility company, TEPCO, and the, the people who were um, suffering as a result of this, um, the more opposed to nuclear power I became. So then I thought, well, um, what's better? Um, which is uh, the worst of these four fuels? Uh, nuclear, oil, natural gas, and coal? And unfortunately, the answer I came to was all of them. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, you, you write about your, uh, your trip to Fukushima in your latest uh, two-volume book. Um, I, I had the great pleasure of reading that, and I was really struck by the structure of it because it reads like a, um, a letter to the future that is part apology uh, and part explanation for why we didn't do more in the here and now to uh, mitigate climate change. And so I would love to know um, why, why that structure? Why a letter to the future and a focus on the now instead of perhaps say what we might be able to do if we, uh, if we could uh, actually put some solutions into action? Well, for one thing, it's easier to be calm about the whole thing if we just suppose that it's already over. Um, <laughs> that, uh, our generation is gone, and we've left the world worse than we found it. And um, they're wondering why we were so foolish. Um, and the second reason is that, um, unfortunately, there really is very little that any of us in this room can do about it. Um, it's not a matter of um, you know, setting the thermostat a little differently. Um, a lot of these um, greenhouse gases are released um, through processes such as agriculture. Um, rice growing in Japan, which seems very innocuous, releases 50% of that country's methane, which is a very dangerous greenhouse gas. Um, manufacturing uh, all over the world is extremely wasteful. Um, when uh, molten metal is turned into sheet metal, about half of the metal has to be remelted, just because we're not bothering to really think about how to uh, design our sheet metal. There are all these things that need to be worked on, um, and we can't do it. Um, all we can do is um, make a noise and hope that we get um, some government officials, some regulators who are not foxes <coughs> in the house. And, um, I don't have much hope there. Um, well, speaking of not having much hope, David, <laughs> um, uh, last summer you wrote um, the article The Uninhabitable Earth. Um, uh, as Carolyn said, it was uh, quite scary, and, um, but it generated a lot of attention and conversation. I, I think it was somebody at Slate who called it the silent spring of our time. 
Um, but that article, uh, among the, the things that were said about it um, were some criticisms by um, a lot of people uh, in the scientific community and in the journalistic community who said that the piece was almost too scary and that it was actually damaging uh, the conversations that we could be happening. Um, that was last summer that you wrote that. In the months since then, um, what is your thinking on how we should be talking about climate change? Is fear a useful tool? Um, yeah, I, I personally, I think very much so. Um, you know, I, I, I heard a lot in the aftermath of the article's publication from people who felt that, um, um, you know, that there was a real risk of turning off possible activists or turning off possible political activity, um, that there would be a kind of a burnout effect or that people would give up hope and lose, um, lose faith that anything could be done. And I think, you know, a lot of those um, criticisms came from activists themselves, and I do think that among people who have devoted themselves and their lives to this issue, that is a risk. Um, you know, you can sort of start to give up and lose energy. But when I look at, you know, the country as a whole, the planet as a whole, um, it just strikes me as so transparently true that the average person is not scared enough about climate change rather than that they're too scared about climate change. And um, it felt to me, and still feels to me, that if the risk is turning off a few activists um, and the benefit is turning on many, 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 many more people, especially given, as, as Bill was saying, that the main thing that we need to do if we want to forestall these damaging effects is take political action, um, that that's a trade-off that should, is very much worth making. Um, on top of which, there was just the argument of like, it's the truth. Um, and, um, you know, it, it was funny to watch um, as the article came out and the, the response um, to it, which was much, much bigger than I would have anticipated and as a result generated a lot more conversation among the scientists on whose work I was depending than I expected. Um, and a number of them did object to the sort of overall gloomy tone, the headlining, the name of the piece, and a couple of the more um, dramatic statements um, about what could happen. But the, um, the sort of detail by detail factual accuracy of the article was, I mean, it was so directly pulled from their papers that they couldn't possibly <laughs> object to it. Um, but it did raise this issue, which I actually had written about a little bit in the piece, um, in part because some of them had spoken with me about it, um, called scientific reticence, which is the tendency of people who are doing this work to not want to share the scariest information that they've uncovered with the public for fear that it would be damaging, um, undermine public action, or scare people, turn people off too much. And, you know, I, there are a lot of reasons why I found that um, impulse objectionable, um, but I would just say sort of chiefly, as, you know, as a journalist, I feel like um, if there is news, if it's good enough to publish in science or publish in nature, um, then an interested public should be trusted to interpret it and respond to it on their own. Um, and that the idea that um, those who know the science best should be editing what they learn um, in order to sort of protect the public, I mean, that's patronizing and problematic. Um, but it's also, as again, if we're trying to produce political action, it's, um, I think, really damaging. Um, I think that there's an enormous amount of energy that can come from fear, um, and people do take, people do organize and, and um, you know, take action if they're scared. And um, there were just so much, so much being left on the table if we said that we were not gonna be willing to scare people. Um, and it also, you know, then there's also the issue, issue of trust, which is to say, like, just over the last year since my article was published, um, we had this unprecedented hurricane season in the Caribbean. Um, we had this unprecedented wildfire season in California. People haven't really heard about the flooding in South Asia that took place this past year, but um, we are already entering into a new era for climate disaster. And I think that the world is waking up to how dramatic these changes will be. And if scientists continue to say, more or less, um, changes are happening, but it's all gonna be okay, I think that they risk alienating the public that they're really hoping to reach. And one of the things I was trying to do in my piece was to, to reach that public. So, yeah. 
Um, Chantal, I, I want to talk to you uh, as a theater practitioner um, about the public for a moment because I think a lot of people go to the theater uh, as a form of escape. And uh, your theater uh, is, um, I'm going to use the word political in the sense that climate change is a politicized topic, you know, especially as it is in this country. Um, so, who is your ideal audience member? Is it somebody who's already on board with climate change uh, and just wants to see an artistic representation of it? Uh, are you hoping to change minds with your work? Who do you hope is in the seat? Theater is such a rarefied um, art form that I don't, I, you know, I can't imagine that anybody who is not concerned about climate change would show up to see a play about it. So, <laughs> I, you know, it's not in my best interest to think that I'm going to change minds. Um, there are some instances where I've been in a situation where people who didn't necessarily believe came. Um, and this was, um, I had a play done at Kansas State University. And there was a, I know for a fact that there was a student in the play whose family didn't believe in climate change at all, and yet they came and they supported this person, mm -hmm. you know, because it was their son. So, you know, there might be a few instances like that where somebody would come, but otherwise it's a self-selected audience. So I go on, um, I think of the study, The Six Americas, that was done by, um, I think it's Yale and uh, George Mason, which uh, separates the Americans into six categories in relation to climate change from the most alarmed to the deniers, mm -hmm. and then uh, a, a series of um, categories in between uh, of people who are concerned, and the alarmed are actually a small percentage, and the deniers are a small percentage, and most people are somewhere in between. And so I'm thinking, okay, somebody who's gonna come and see a play about climate change might be they're already thinking about it, they're, you know, they're willing to go as far as going to see a play about it, then maybe the play can help them take an extra step, you know, maybe they think about it, but maybe now they're gonna do something. And one of my um, personal favorite success was um, an event we did um, this past fall where uh, there was a, uh, we showed a few sh very short plays and there was a conversation afterwards and there was a man in the audience who at the end of the evening said, um, you know, I've been thinking about this for a while now and I think I'm ready to take another step in my life and be become more active. And I, you know, I, it's not, I mean, a play is just sort of one more little thing, but it just happened to be the tipping point, I think, for him at that point. But I'm, I keep hoping that you give people a bunch of little things and eventually they reach the tipping point. Um, so, um, you know, as we can kind of see here, you guys are all writing in very different mediums and are taking some different approaches to the study of climate change. Um, but again, another thing that you all have in common is that you all engage in some impressive research to, uh, to write the things that you do. Um, that said, in conversations that I've had with uh, scientists and other writers, it seems like that climate change is notoriously difficult to write about because it contains so many data sets and so many different types of science. Uh, a lot of it rather esoteric and, and difficult to understand if you're not a specialist. So with that said, I would love to hear from each of you um, about when you're researching, how you know you have something that is the spark for a story. Um, or maybe put another way, how you shape that research into a narrative that people like me can understand. Um, Bill, should we start with you? Sure. Um, I had so much help uh, on this book from experts. Um, and uh, one man who really helped me uh, is a guy named Peter Tons at the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. He corrected my numbers and um, he told me one thing that really shocked me. I kept thinking, well, if only we could sign the Paris Accords and reduce our emissions and so forth. Um, you know, all of these different greenhouse gases are measured in terms of the 100 year global warming potential of carbon dioxide, which is our most prevalent 
greenhouse gases, about 80%. Um, Dr. Tons uh, told me that having a 100-year um, descriptor is ridiculous. Um, he said in 2,000 years, that carbon dioxide will warm eight times as much as in that 100 years. If we stop all of our emissions tomorrow, um, some of that carbon dioxide is still going to be warming the planet and um, elevating the oceans for up to seven or 8,000 years. Um, that was something that really uh, sank in with me. <laughs> yeah, and it's, I think we've been really blinded by how much the um, reporting and conversation about climate ends at year 2100. Um, you know, there are the people who study the, um, the Arctic ice sheets and the oceans say that um, in the end game, the oceans are going to be at least 50 meters higher than they are now. Um, <clears throat> and there's also this amazing fact I, I learned the other day that um, the, uh, the net effect of our non-carbon pollution, um, all the aerosols that we have in the air, all the other stuff that we burn, has been keeping the planet about a degree Celsius cooler than it would be otherwise, um, which is that's pollution that's killing literally hundreds of thousands of people each day. But if we took that out of the air, then we'd have a planet that was already at two degrees Celsius, which is the um, the Paris goal, which not that long ago was defined as the threshold of climate catastrophe, and it's now our like optimistic um, scenario. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, it's it's. The more you learn, really, the more harrowing it is. Um, to your more particular question, I mean, I um, I came to this subject as an amateur, as an eager reader, but as an amateur, and I mostly tested myself. So if there was some bit of news that I screamed holy shit about when I was reading, I was like, this is an exciting piece of, uh, you know, I have a, kind of a perverse um, cast of mind, so I was like, you know, this is like an exciting thing to include in my article. Um, and things that I felt were a little more um, dry or familiar, I was like less um, inclined to emphasize. But I also think that um, personally, working on this mostly over the last few years, I've been lucky because there's been a lot of really interesting, exciting, emerging new science um, in areas that had not yet really been written about or talked about. Um, you know, for decades we've known a lot about sea level rise. Um, we've known a bit about um, some of the other, you know, some of the effects, on the direct heat effects and that kind of thing, but there's all of this emerging research about the effect on economic growth, on conflict, um, there's even some new research which I didn't get a chance to write about, about the effect on mental health, um, and all of these areas are, have been basically untouched by um, so most climate writers and most climate scientists, and so there was just this bounty of new, exciting research to um, a load on the reader, and I think one of the reasons that my, uh, my magazine story was so successful was that it did feel new in that way. Um, I think that most people who, most kind of liberal, um, middle of the road readers, people who read the, the climate coverage in the New York Times every day and Washington Post occasionally, that kind of person, they were familiar with the threat, the sea level threat. They were familiar with um, you know the melting of the ice caps, but um, the idea that we be losing an enormous amount of our capacity to produce food over the next century, or that we'd be dealing with a complete new scale of um, global ec epidemic because of climate change. All of these were really, really new ideas to them, um, and as a result, like really terrifying. And um, it meant that it, it added up to a story that was, um, as I said before, global, total. It was not a matter of, well, if you live on the coast, buy some land 20 miles inland and you'll be fine. Um, it was really like every aspect of your life, no matter who you are, no matter where you are, will be affected over the next decades, um, and there's no escaping it. Uh, with the arts, I feel it's a, it's a little bit different because it's not really, um, I don't see it as my responsibility to convey like the, the facts, you know, it's not, um, I don't have the same responsibility as the journalist or the, the scientist as to convey really the fact of uh, climate change. I do want uh, the stories I tell to be um, accurate, but um, it's less in the detail and it's more about finding, I think it's about taking the science and finding 
what it means and also what it means to humans. Like theater is very much about putting people on stage. So how can, can the, the science be translated into um, what it means to people to, in their day-to-day -day life? Like how can we take this big thing and then bring it down to um, a, a lifetime? Or even uh, sometimes it can be longer, but something that's a bit uh, more, maybe more accessible and more readily understandable um, than, than sometimes just looking at the big picture. So I do, I do do a lot of research and, and talk to people, but then I try to distill that research and to put just enough to make people curious. So at the intermission, you know, they're looking stuff up on their phone or <laughs> they, they ask me, okay, what, you know, which book should I read or who should I talk to? Um, so it's a, it's a point to, to try to um, invite people to go deeper. Just to pick up on that for a second, I mean, I, I think, um, I was talking a, a minute ago about all the, the research, but I think the thing that seems most missing to me when I look out and think about how people are engaging with climate change is the storytelling. I mean, the, the truth is, like, the data is out there. It's even in, it's in the CNN stories, it's in the New York Times stories, if you're reading it. It's just that um, those stories are so often told in such clinical ways and such segmented ways that you miss the big picture. And there's an incredible, urgent need for great storytelling about climate that really connects those dots for people and, as you say, like places the story in the context of a single life or a single set of lives so that they know that, um, you know, this is not, we're not talking about the year 2300 when who knows what technology will be um, available to us. These are conflicts um, and, you know, impacts that are going to be felt not just by our children, but by us in our lifetimes. I think that's an incredibly important story that really has not been told nearly enough. People often talk about the pace of climate change and what they mean is that they think it's so slow that we have a hard time grasping it. But I think really the, the, the thing is that it's, it's too fast for us to be um, thinking seriously about. Um, that, you know, I often say that half of all the carbon that we've emitted in the history of humanity has been emitted since Al Gore published his first book on climate, which is like since Tiger Woods played his first like uh, masters, since the notorious B.I.G. released Ready to Die. Like these are, <laughs> these are, this is not a long period of time. And um, we've done more than half of the damage that we've done to the environment in just that 25 year period. That's incredibly fast when you think about what, what kind of damage, with the scale of the damage that we're talking about. And I think that um, we've, we've really not done a good enough job of storytelling about that speed. Um, every year that we're not taking action is just another, you know, it's, it's really, really bad. <laughs> <laughs> and I think, I think there's something very um, hopeful about uh, storytelling, even though the outcome may be very uh, dire. And, um, you know, I personally, I'm not in. I'm not invested or I don't have a strong opinion as to whether we're going to make it as a species or not. And in a way, it, it almost doesn't matter to me because it's, it's a little bit like if I put it, I bring it down to a personal level, it's like being diagnosed with a terminal illness. Do you like try to live your days with dignity and fight until the end or do you say, do you ask the doctor all the terrible ways in which it's gonna hurt and you know be bad and just give in to that? So I think the, the most important thing, I mean, if we wanna keep our, our um, integrity as a species, it's just like, let's, let's try to go through this with as much dignity as possible and, and let's do try to make it, you know, so the earth is livable, but I, I don't think that should be, in a way, the thing we focus on because there's so much of it that's out of our hands. I think it's just about like day to day, like how do we make this better? Yeah, I really agree. And um, one of the things that Chantal um, wrote in her play, Sila, I thought was quite sad, but also uh, consoling at the same time, so I wrote it down. <laughs> we may use our breath when we roam the land, but we must surrender it once we pass from the land. Creatures who are lonely are the ones who hold on to their breath as if it were theirs and theirs alone. Uh, I think that's very beautifully put. And um, I tend to think a little bit that way when I'm writing for this unknown future, which might be a future that's a, a beetle civilization. For all we know, we may be long gone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, 
So uh, one of the key words in the title of this panel series is activism, uh, art and activism in the Anthropocene. Um, as journalists, a novelist, a playwright, do you guys see yourselves also as activists? Yes. <laughs> Yes, I used to say no, and then people would correct me all the time. <laughs> they would point out all the ways in which I was being an activist, so now I say yes. And there's one project in particular um, that we do that is very much about activism, and um, it's called, you uh, mentioned it when you introduced me, Amy, it's called Climate Change Theater Action. And it, it happens every other year. We did it in 2015, just this past fall. We commissioned 50 writers from around the world, so every continent is represented, to write a short play five minutes long about an aspect of climate change. And then we make this collection of 50 plays available to people who want to present an event. Um, it was in the seven, seven weeks around COP23. And um, so the, the plays are free. People can do readings, performances. Some of them have done radio shows. Um, site-specific presentations at the foot of glaciers. There are people here who did events that um, involve dancing. Um, and it's, it's about uh, helping people, giving people the tools to have a conversation that is not uh, uh, based in uh, science necessarily, and it's not also based in politics, and where they can bring all of themselves. You know, they can actually talk about being afraid or, or, or not knowing what to do. Like, the emotions can be dealt with as opposed to, to being in a more sort of um, maybe more clinical environment or something where the, it's, the, it's a bit more loaded. So that project is very much about trying to, to help people, again, take, go one step further. And in addition to the theatrical presentation, um, we ask people to do an action if they can, which is um, either connecting. So in the case, there uh, have been several universities who have participated and they connect with other departments, which doesn't happen too often, like with the environmental science or with the hard sciences. Or um, it was about taking maybe a political um, step, like uh, writing letters to representatives or something like that. So that project, I feel, is like uh, giving people artistic tools and encouraging them to be activists too. Uh, I think I think of myself mostly still as a storyteller rather than an activist, but um, it's sort of hard to avoid doing the work of activism when you're telling this kind of a story. Um, it's sort of electrifying at a moral level, um, and you see that in the response that it generates in, in readers, um, and that's exciting. I mean, obviously, I care deeply about the fate of the planet, and um, if I can do a little bit to help that, that's fantastic. Um, but my, I would say, in sort of day-to-day -day way, my main objectives are really still about um, storytelling more than activism. But I'm actually especially curious to know what Bill says, since in your in that beautiful opening to your new book, you, you sort of write about how you are not doing enough, and none of us are doing enough. Um, so I'm curious to know how you answer that question. Well, I wish I could do something good and important in my life before I die. Um, if Someone read Carbon Ideologies and said, oh, Bill, you know, now I understand climate change, I would say, I didn't do enough. Um, if Mr. Pruitt called me up and said, Bill, you know, climate change, then I'd feel pretty good. <laughs> Thank you. Um, as you guys have um, been studying this issue and writing about this issue, um, again, uh, climate change uh, entails so many different types of science and people, and um, it exists uh, in a span of time and um, geographical space that I think is sometimes difficult for people to grasp. Um, so I know, personally, whenever I am reading about it, um, my mind is constantly being blown about um, what, what, it, what we are doing to the planet, what we have done to the planet. So uh, I'm really curious, um, if you guys could pick up the one thing that has surprised you the most in your research about climate change, what would it be? Um, well, I think for me the biggest thing really is that, that speed fact. Um, I mean, you know, that to think that this planet was basically entirely stable, um, climate-wise, when my father was born, 
and then by the time that I die, it will be in a state of complete climate chaos. And um, that, that is the result of the way that we've lived in those intervening generations. And as a result, um, you know, everything that we do acquires this sort of almost mythological scale. I mean, we are really um, taking the planet into our own hands um, every day as a, as a species. And we now have the responsibility of trying to save it over the course of the next century or so. Um, this is not, you know, an endeavor of the scale that humans have ever found themselves engaged in before. And um, that to me is sort of the, the, the grandest, like most kind of, you know, stoner, mind-blowing thing that has occurred to me. Um, I mean, this is really drama at the scale of allegory and parable, but it is real. Um, and we are those actors, we are those gods, we are those, um, and yet we are behaving as though the story is unfolding, um, you know, completely out of our control, and we have, you know, we're just watching it, which is really dispiriting. Uh, okay. Yeah, there was one thing that surprised me recently, and I think it was a, um, an article by Elizabeth Colbert, um, who said that um, in the models that uh, scientists use to predict where we will be, they take into consideration technology to um, capture carbon, and none of that technology will be able to scale fast enough to do something. And when I learned that, I thought, oh my god. <laughs> I mean, we're really worse off than you would think. There's still so much that, that's banking on technology and it's nowhere near um, close to be doing what we want it or what we need it to be. And I think our, just to jump in for a second, one of, the, one of the reasons why we have so much faith in technology is that we've had this couple hundred year run of ever rising incomes, especially in the West and technological advancement. Um, but there's a pretty reasonable perspective on that period of economic growth, which we're the beneficiaries of, that it is really just a story about we're extracting fossil fuels and burning them. And that the entire history of economic growth, which basically didn't exist before the 19th century, um, is the story of the added value of um, carbon. And that once we stop using carbon, we will be unable to produce meaningful, sustained economic growth going forward, um, which is, you know, imperils our whole, all of our trajectories of growth and technological progress, which, as, as you say, we're counting on to save I got to interview the uh, retired CEO of Conoco, who I actually like very much, and uh, who doesn't believe in climate change. Um, and he said, you know, Bill, um, there are all kinds of people in the third world who want to be able to take a hot shower and uh, don't want to have to cook over cow dung anymore. And they're going to head in that direction, and we can't stop them. You know, our... Um, our tragedy, really, is the tragedy of continually increasing demand. You can blame that, if you like, on the capitalist system, although um, the Soviets were all saying, you know, don't worry, the next five-year plan, we're gonna give this much more to the people. Um, so much of this increase in demand is tied up with the legitimate aspirations of very, very poor people who just want to have what we want. Um, and I think that's what, uh, what really surprised me when I started thinking about it. Um, we can blame certain people, um, but you know, can I blame this old lady in Bangladesh I saw who was carrying shocks of corn by hand and sweating, and how nice if she could have um, <coughs> gone home to a little air conditioner or had some um, some filter for her water so she wouldn't get sick or a little electrical help to carry this corn. Um, you know, what can I say to that? Um, I think I have time for one more question before uh, we turn it to the audience. And so um, after this uh, enriching um, and uh, at times dispiriting 
but also um, fascinating conversation. Um, I'm just really curious, and I, and I ask for this as a, a panel moderator, but also as someone who is a fan of all of your work. So I care about you, and I want to know how you're doing. Um, what, how do you feel about the future? Are you hopeful, or are you, um, are you despairing? I'm not despairing. Um, in moments, I am, but I don't think I could. I could get up every day, and I don't know. There's a there's a part. There's enough that's driving me. You know, there's enough that's scary that drives me to do what I do. But at the same thing, I think it would be hard to sustain if I didn't have some hope. But again, I don't. I don't know. I don't know what that. Hope is exactly other than, I think like you, Bill, I hope I can make a difference in the world. Like, I hope I can do something. You know, if somebody was going to ask me on my deathbed, I think I would like to be able to say, I, I did my best, I tried, you know, and that's the best I can do. I guess it, for me it depends on what your, you know, what your definition of hopefulness is. Um, you know, once you've wrapped your mind around the fact that like the planet could conceivably be made uninhabitable in the next century, then something that looks to, from our vantage like total environmental degradation and devastation is like a positive outcome and a reason for hope. Um, and personally, I think that we're much likelier to end up somewhere at like three degrees of warming, which is going to be devastating in all of these ways, but which will still be able to support human civilization like the one that we have now um, with many you know, many people suffering a lot, but still um, sort of carrying on the torch, so to speak. Um, and, you know, that, you know, depending on where you stand, that can be a hopeful perspective, um, as, like, horrifying as it is to say. Um, and, you know, the, the other thing about that is just to connect something I was saying to something I was saying before. Um, you know, we've, we've engineered this devastation in the space of a, a lifetime or two lifetimes. And we now hold it in our power to um, forestall that, um, to slow it down. I think most indications are that we are not taking nearly as much action um, as we should. And things, therefore, are still, you know, just getting worse and worse, even as we um, get more scared about what's possible. But the ultimate lesson of climate change is that, you know, for me anyway, that it is also an invention of human hands. And um, as a result, you can imagine human action being up to the, up to the task. Um, you know, there are a lot of reasons, again, to be not optimistic about doing that, but it is conceivably possible. It's been really interesting to me to see, on the right, among deniers, there's this line that all of these, all the um, temperature variations we're seeing are the result of natural variations, and that therefore we should be less worried about them. And it's like, well, you know, if it was out of our control, that's way scarier. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the fact that we've engineered it means that we are on some level in control of it. We don't have, the ad have an adequate politics to take control of it. We don't have an adequate, um, you know, uh, energy, um, new energy sources, et cetera, to take control of it in the way that we should. But on some theoretical level, it is within our control, and therefore, like, you know, there is, I think, reason for some moderate hope. <laughs> I've always loved apocalyptic science fiction, and so I couldn't help but just really enjoy David's art. <laughs> and I thought, you know, now I'm going to be the hero, at least to myself, of one of these horrible stories. It's kind of an adventure in a way. Um, I don't know uh, how many of you uh, read the book or saw the movie The Road, uh, you know, but that had quite an effect on me. And at first I thought, you know, how grim, how terrible. And then I thought, you know, the father's love for his son and the desire to have his son live on after him, how wonderfully ordinary. You know, like, um, I hope that my daughter's going to be around after I'm gone. And I hope the human race is going to live on after I'm gone. You know, and I'll do what little I can. But I know that at some point I have to be gone. And it's not that bad. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys very much. 
Um, I think we now have time for questions from the audience. Does anyone want to ask? Yes, this gentleman right yeah. here. Hi, I have a question. Great panel, thank you very much. I'm curious, if, if all three of you were wildly successful and you had just a huge readership, massive, let's say you know, billions of people, suddenly, suddenly understood what you understand, on a very practical level, then what would they do? I elect politicians who made climate a uh, first order priority and not like a sixth or seventh order priority. Um, I think that's the, for me, that's the main. Switch to renewable energy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, to, I think uh, the consumerism in the developed countries have, has to go down. Like there would be a huge, I think there would be a shift in values. Yeah, that would, that would the values that would sustain um, a different world. Reduce demand. Reduce demand for almost everything. You could do that by reducing population, by reducing consumption, by making manufacturing and agriculture more efficient. Um, none of it may be enough, but that's what I would have everybody do. I recently went to hear of Naomi Klein and Michelle Alexander. I don't know if any of you were there. And what I like about it was talking about the intersectionality between progressive movements and um, basically saving the environment. And that was really hopeful. Um, speak to that from your point of view. Because what Nana Klein is saying is that the solution to both things is one thing. It's, it's people that are working in progressive movements also focusing on uh, the degradation of the earth. And you touched on it a little bit when, in, in your last statement, when you talked about people in third world countries. Uh, and I thought it was sorely missing in some of the other comments, um, that it's all just about manufacturing and technology, when the fact is this has been going on for um, basically the rise of Europe in the world. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it didn't just start you know, in your advanced generation. That's just when it picked up, but it started with, you know, the land coming from the Native Americans and the, the you know, the, the forcing of people from one context to the other as labor. So when, when they, when Michelle and, and Naomi talked about bringing these two things together to find a common solution, to me it was hopeful. Talk mm -hmm. about how you see climate change interacting with, uh, with other progressive movements, and if you think there's any hope there for the two to marry and find solutions. I think that um, oftentimes um, environmental disasters um, affect um, disadvantaged people. Um, in, uh, in West Virginia, there was a horrible chemical spill in 2014 of a coal cleaning chemical um, that affected the drinking water of about 300,000 people. Um, and, you know, they're only rednecks from Appalachia, so who cares, you know? Um, but as more and more of this stuff happens, I think um, people who are from these communities think, you know what, this is really, really important for me. Um, when I was in college, I was in the anti-nuclear movement, and we went to an occupation blockade at Seabrook, New Hampshire. This was in 1980. And, um, you know, uh, some of the townspeople told me, look, you know, um, you're just a bunch of privileged white kids. Um, you know, the people of color don't have time for your, you know, aesthetic um, skullduggery, you know? <laughs> Do something useful. And now, I think, uh, it's really nice to see more and more people of all races and creeds seeing, yeah, this is, this is important and the more we can all work together and say it's not just about protecting you know, some mountain where some rich person lives. It's about uh, protecting the air and the climate you know, for all of us, um, you know, the better off we're going to be. Yeah, I, I, as, as Bill was just saying, I mean, the, um, the impacts of climate change are going to be felt overwhelmingly by the world's poor, and um, that's you know 
tragic on many different levels. Um, Bangladesh is like really like the kind of ground zero. I mean, the whole country could well be underwater by the end of the century, and um, that's completely horrifying. Those are hundreds of millions of people. Um, and considering that the Syrian refugee crisis, which was just several million, like completely scrambled European geopolitics, you can just imagine what a refugee crisis that's a hundred times or more um, will do to our global politics. Um, and I think it's really important to keep in mind um, that you know that it's it's uh, as I said, like these are the people who are suffering the most. But I think it's also important to remember that the main drivers of our fate are as was saying a minute ago, um, are, is the growth and modernization of, in particular, India and China. Um, that, um, and China in particular has been, um, you know, taken huge steps over the last year or two, which is very, very hopeful. But they're not taking those steps for progressive reasons. Um, they're taking those steps because they want to save their population from the public health disasters that they've seen industrialization inflict on the country. And, um, as weird as it is to say, like we, we are we like turn towards Xi Jinping um, to like save us. Um, it's not you know the domestic politics in America are are so limited in, in how they can affect the fate of the world, and um, really like the dictatorship of um, this one country, China, is going to be much 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 more important to the lives of our children and grandchildren, um, and that's. As activists, pseudo activists, half time activists, like that's a little bit hard to wrap our heads around. But um, truthfully, like the behavior of the United States, even the behavior of all of the West, is um, you know marginal compared to the impact that um, India and China will have on the next century or two of, um, of climate. And um, you know, I applaud activism here for sure, and I'm, I'm you know a man of the left personally, and. Um, but I'm mostly I'm just crossing my fingers and hoping that the leaders in India and China do what um, what is necessary and important. And in, in a kind of perverse way, I actually see the the actions that China has taken um, as being inspired by the evacuation of American moral leadership on climate. That if um, Hillary Clinton was president and we were still a party to the Paris Accords and still trying to like rally the world, I'm not sure that Xi Jinping would have been as aggressive in. Um, taking action as he has. And I think there's a way in which we look back 30 years from now and say, weirdly, the election of Donald Trump was like the best thing that would happen to the planet because it really spurred action among the nations in the world that yeah, needed to take action. Not that we don't need to take action, but we're, you know, we have less of an impact. Uh, so comment over here. Yeah, I it's amazing you brought up China because um, I was in Hong Kong two weeks ago. You never see a blue sky children live there. And my son-in-law had to go to Beijing. Now there's a, a number 300. Is that the carbon that's safe? The air quality index, I think it's called. Parts per million probably. Okay. It, was, it was 1,200 <laughs> the week he was there. This is two weeks ago. 1,200 and 300 is supposed to be the limit. And everyone, every single person, this is Beijing where she lives, everyone had a mask. Uh, they stayed in, you know, he's a bank, he's an, an expat working there. So I wanted to ask you, so I'm, I'm a little worried, and I was in Hungary at 90 when they had those old cars, and you couldn't even breathe. I mean, your whole body felt hard in 90. And remember, and I think we came in and cleaned up a lot of the air and those things. I want to ask you, where would, could we have been, do you think, if Gore had won? I hate to do all this. But I think about it, you know, quite a bit. And I mean, what do you think he could have gotten done you know, if he had a Congress? I'd like you to answer that. No mind. Well, um, you know, on some level, the answer is about the limits of um, the limits of, of the kinds of national government and international cooperation that we have. I mean, no nation that signed the Paris Accord is on track to meet its obligations. Not a single one. So um, the leadership of a single individual who was committed to this issue could have made some difference for sure, and probably also would have um, done less destruction to the sort of US-led post-Cold War global order that, would have been, that could have been a much more efficient way of handling this issue than the, um, than the, the place we find ourselves in now. But um, ultimately, um, 
you know, it's, it's really hard to keep these commitments. People are, uh, we're addicted to economic growth, and in many parts of the world that means burning more fossil fuels rather than less. Um, and for many reasons, I wish that Al Gore had been elected president. It's amazing that this, that election, which seemed at the time to be like the least consequential election in American history, may have been like the most consequential in American history. Um, but uh, I think that a lot of these forces are much bigger than a single individual. Um, and yeah, that's how I'd answer that. I don't know if you guys have different perspectives. I guess the other thing I would say is that um, where we really started going it alone was after September 11th. And so if Gore had been president when September 11th happened and he had actually worked more with the international community, then maybe we all could have gotten more done. It's hard to say. I just, one other thing about the air quality that you mentioned, I, there was a study a few weeks ago that um, just looking at the air quality difference between what we would have if we were a 1.5 degree warmer world and a world that was two degrees warmer. So two degrees is like the Paris goal. It's almost certainly we're not going to hit it, but it's like the optimistic goal. 1.5 is like that you're crazy optimistic that things will get there. But in the, the gap between 1.5 and two degrees, the, um, the statistician said would cost um, 150 million lives just from the carbon, not the non-carbon pollution in the air that would be produced by the by the difference in those two um, warming thresholds. So. That is, you know, 25 holocausts that we will be inevitably inflicting on the world just by, if we meet the optimistic goal of the Paris Accords, we will be inflicting 25 holocausts of death just from the non-carbon pollution that it will be in the atmosphere on top of all the suffering that would have happened at 1.5 degrees. And we're almost certain to blow past two degrees to get to, I would say, three or three and a half degrees by the end of the century. Um, and you know, it's just amazing how little moral opprobrium is attached to that um, indifference. On the bright side, <laughs> <laughs> think how all those deaths will reduce demand. <laughs> wow. 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 Thanks, good point. Uh, I think I saw he's over here in blue. Um, I come from Europe, from Italy, where the climate change is talked about in a completely different way. So I'm very sensitive and interested in how climate change is discussed and what you call the storytelling, so the narratives around it. And so I wonder whether perhaps one of the reasons why climate change hasn't been, uh, hasn't really uh, been talked about as a sexy one to say topic is because maybe we are using the wrong words to refer to it. So I wonder whether perhaps you should think about new ways of phrasing the very topic, climate change. This mm -hmm. comes to me as a very neutral uh, kind of phrasing that perhaps doesn't alert people as it should be. Do you have some suggestions? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, I think that uh, in Italy we perceive, uh, we have a different sense of um, how global history has been affected by our colonialist past, and so we tackle the issue of guilt in a different way. And so the actual phrasing is the same, but it resonates with us in a different way. And so the question of whether climate change is happening or not is not the question. It's actually we are sure that this is happening, just a matter of how to, to deal with it. Whereas here, in the US, there's still a conversation about whether or not we are going towards its direction. So I don't have an alternative, but I would like it to be so really I know that sometimes people are successful talking about it. Um, depending on who the audience is in terms that matters to them. Like they will talk to farmers about things that affect you know, their farming without having to say the words climate change. Um, and then at least we leave that out of the equation, the whole um, political uh, weight of climate change out of the equation and they're able to um, come to some, uh, I've met somebody who, who tries to help farmers be more effective and be more sustainable. Um, and it, it is something that, that has to do with climate change, but she doesn't use those words at all. And she, she, she just uses the terminology that they use and she is trying to help them uh, be better. So, um, you know, I, if we can engage people in that way, sometimes we can bypass the political charge of, climate change.
And I think um, extreme weather is really useful in this respect too. I mean, it's it's it used to be that if you were trying to get people scared about climate change, you'd have to be projecting deeply into the future. And now there's enough really horrifying um, climate disaster that you can just point to the news, you can point to you know that year's um, meteorological data, um, and most people understand what it already what an unprecedented time we're living in. I think that's very helpful, even if it's also terrifying. Yeah, uh, we have time for one more question. Yeah, uh, let's see, I saw the hand in the back. Um, I guess I'll stand up. So I'll, I'll look at that. But um, what do you guys think? I know we always talk about like our children, our children's generation, like future generations um, that will really feel the effect. Um, what do you think about like space as kind of a way to, you know, like I know Elon Musk is going, you know, trying to. <laughs> Go to Mars and find a way to you know plant you know seeds so that future generations can kind of mitigate what stuff that's grounded. I just wanted to see you guys uh, your opinion on that sort of kind of um, option um, instead of staying grounded and trying to mitigate stuff here on Earth. all three of you. If we don't learn from what we've done here, I doubt we can do better on another planet. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think um, the absolute worst case climate scenario for Earth is going to be way, 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 way more habitable than any of the other planets that we're talking about visiting. So there is scientific value in visiting them and maybe even in colonizing them, but it's going to be a lot harder to set up like a large scale colony on Mars than it would be to save a totally degraded Earth for human. I mean, you know, if you need, if you need to build like a greenhouse, you could just build a greenhouse here. Um, so, I mean, I think it's a, basically a little bit crazy. <laughs> yeah, it seems as if it would be a very small number of people, and in the future they might become genetically inbred, there'd be a lot of radiation damage on the way. And um, so, um, in a way, it might not be much different from a very few people surviving on Earth somewhere. Uh, Phil, David, Chantel, thank you so much. Thank you.